Good evening. Um, my name is Nick Lemon. Um, I'm the Dean Emeritus of Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. Um, it, I'm kind of the warm-up act for the real Dean of the School of Journalism, Steve Call, who's going to be here for the, the rest of the program, but was coming from something else. A uh, warm welcome to Columbia University. And as you all know, uh, we're here tonight to present the John Chancellor Award for Excellence in Journalism on the 20th anniversary of the award. The award was established in 1995 by Ira A. Lippmann, the founder of Guardsmark, one of the largest private security firms in the world. Ira is here, you'll meet him later, but wave, thanks. Um, and it honors the legacy of one of the greatest broadcast journalists of our time, John Chancellor. Welcome, Ira. Thank you for creating this award. And I'd also like to welcome some of the children and grandchildren of the late John Chancellor. Uh, so w when I call your name, just stand up and wave to folks, please. Uh, Mary and Barnaby Chancellor. Uh, Nicholas Gregory. And uh, we're fortunate to have two uh, previous John Chancellor Award winners uh, with us tonight. So I'd like them to stand up. Um, John Kiffner, where are you, John? And uh, Henry Weinstein. And, uh, you know, this is not one of those awards where we open the envelope at the moment of high drama. We all know who our winner is. It's uh, Bar Paris Bureau Chief, longtime foreign correspondent for the New York Times and other uh, papers, Alyssa Rubin. Could you stand up and say hi? <laughs> And we'll see, uh, we'll see a, lot more of her, uh, a lot more of her later. Um, just in the spirit of, of uh, absent friends uh, and honoring them, the, the person after Ira who's really primarily responsible for making this award happen uh, is the late David Halberstam. Um, You may hear this story later of what the connection is, but it's a good story, so I hope you don't deny us that story, Ira. Um, but but uh, David uh, was a friend to many of us and mentor to some of us and uh, a great journalist, and um, his his spirit is, is, is here tonight. Um, this award, as you'll hear again later, is, is uh, an unusual award because it's, it's a, kind of a lifetime achievement award. It's not for one thing you did, like the Pulitzer Prizes. It, it, it's, the idea is honoring people who have just stayed with it year in, year out, and done really extraordinary work. And, and, um, Often in the, in the years that we've been doing this award, uh, we've been benefiting from extraordinary timing, and we are again this year. Um, those of you who know Alyssa's work, and if you don't, you'll know a lot more by the end of the evening, know that um, what's going on now in Paris and in the Middle East um, is uh, proof of how incredibly important it is to journalism and to society to have reporters like her uh, doing the work they do. Um, we're grateful to the members of the Chancellor Award Selection Committee for sharing their insight and values. They will be introduced to you later this evening. Um, when Ira brought the John Chancellor Award to Columbia 11 years ago, he also created the John Chancellor Scholarship at Columbia. Since then, uh, 13 students with outstanding academic achievement and the leadership qualities of John Chancellor have received the scholarship. It's my pleasure to introduce this year's Chancellor Scholar, Thomas Himes. Where are you? There. He's a Master of Science student in the Journalism School in our documentary program. He served in the United States Navy, graduated from the University of Pennsylvania, and spent six years 
working as a staff writer for three newspapers in California and Florida, where his reporting has been credited with exposing malfeasance and helping correct injustice. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Ira, for paying tribute to the memory of a great journalist by generously supporting the education of new ones. Helping students learn to practice good journalism is an important gift with lasting impact. We'll start the ceremony after dinner, and at that point, uh, Steve Call, our dean, will be manning the podium. Uh, so uh, nice to see everybody again briefly. Enjoy dinner, welcome, and we'll pick up again after dinner. Thanks a lot. Welcome back to the program. I'm Steve Call. I'm the, the dean of the journalism school. I'd like to thank my predecessor and friend Nick Lemon for filling in uh, the earlier part of the evening. I was teaching, and I'm really glad now to be with you. And uh, as we get back to our celebration and uh, programming, there are a couple of other people to acknowledge. Um, first and most happily, I want to uh, acknowledge at table three uh, Alyssa's mother, Enid Rubin, who on November 25, <laughs> I won't make you stand, but I know you uh, are still incredibly able and active, and on November 25, about to celebrate your 90th birthday, so congratulations. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the Chancellor Award Selection Committee, um, and because it included Nick, he didn't have a chance uh, to do that, but if you would all please stand, Nick Lemon, Mary Chancellor, Hank Klebanoff, Ira Lippman, Michelle Norris, Lynn Schur, Bill Wheatley, and Mark Whitaker. Um, some new judges this year, and I, I stopped by during their work, and I know how hard and diligently they, they deliberated this year, and it's really um, a really profound act of volunteer, volunteerism. I'm very grateful for it. Um, I'd also like to remember one of our past judges, Dory Maynard, who passed away at the age of 56, I know many of you knew her. She was really a remarkable and influential force in journalism, a ty in tireless pursuit of diversity in newsrooms and in our coverage and in our uh, thinking about the world. And it's, a, it's very sad to recognize that she's uh, passed so young. As Nick mentioned, um, this really is different from most other journalism awards because it's about the whole body of work and the person and the, the landscapes that they've covered professionally and the uh, record that they're accumulating, whether on the page or on the screen. And um, also, I think the judges have over the years really tried to concentrate on winners who have contributed to the public good in some broad sense, but important sense. And uh, Alyssa, uh, really is one of the, the most um, deserving winners that, of the time that I've been associated with the award. And, and I, was, I was telling her, I dropped in on the judging when the group was getting started and saw a very long list of very worthy candidates and thought silently to myself, boy, I sure hope Alyssa Rubin wins. And then I thought I should, since I have this office, uh, <laughs> I thought I should uh, leave before I said anything that like put my foot on the pedal or something and and then uh, eight hours later I was told that she she had won. I first met her in Baghdad uh, in odd circumstances where a friend of mine had had passed while working in in Baghdad and she was so gracious in bringing me to on a tour of his uh, last days and and then have uh, she was reminding me that the last time we uh, were together in Kabul we, we had a cup of coffee at the Lebanese Taverna before uh, it went down um, in, a, in an unfortunate attack by the Taliban. And um, more than knowing her personally, I've, I've really admired uh, her on the page for so many years um, at the Los Angeles Times and, and at the New York Times. And you'll hear, I don't think there is a foreign correspondent uh, anywhere in our business who has covered as much ground, stayed as long. Uh, at the really hard moments of the stories, um, years and years in, in the dark days in Baghdad, and years and years uh, in Kabul through all kinds of uh, 
uh, trials and changes, and, and yet remain so consistent and so committed, and that's available to all of us on the page. That's what's so remarkable about her work. Uh, while covering the Yazidi refugee crisis in northern Iraq in August of 2014, she was in a helicopter that crashed while evacuating refugees and delivering aid, and she uh, suffered a concussion and broken wrists, and she has had to recuperate, which she's done bravely and successfully, but only through multiple surgeries and a lot of uh, physical therapy and, and walking to work in Paris, which is at least a good end part of the physical therapy. And she's now back reporting in Afghanistan uh, and was there as recently as last week. Uh, she flew home to Paris early Saturday to the news of the attacks there. I didn't know until she got off the plane what had happened and uh, had to fight through long uh, delays at customs. And she's been reporting on them ever since. And we're very grateful that she made the effort so characteristic of her to break away from that work to be here with us tonight and to make this evening uh, so important. So um, just briefly, she began her career at the Los Angeles Times as a foreign correspondent uh, and was there for Af in Afghanistan and Pakistan, um, in Iraq. She had many positions on their foreign staff, Paris bureau chief, Vienna bureau chief, Baghdad bureau co-chief, Baghdad correspondent. The New York Times uh, very wisely hired her away in 2007, and she became Baghdad correspondent, Baghdad bureau chief, she held that until 2009, and you remember uh, how rough those years were. And then she um, was rewarded for her service in Baghdad with a transfer to Kabul uh, in 2009, and she stayed there until 2014. And um, somewhere along the way, someone had the, the good sense to think that Paris was in her future, and so that's uh, where she, she transferred after five years in, in Kabul. She's a graduate of Brown, member of Phi Beta Kappa, has an MA degree in history from here at, here at Columbia with a concentration in modern Europe. And so welcome back to Columbia, Alyssa, among many other things. And now I'm pleased uh, to set the sort of context for this award very briefly for those of you who haven't been with us before um, with a tribute to John Chancellor and to explain where this award's values were located and, and how it began. Um, so video, a tribute video that we're uh, very grateful to Tom Brokaw for making the time to help um, help create. So as Warner Wolf would say, let's roll the video. This is a message of journalism coming to you now from NBC News in New York, written by me, or who's been around for a while. That's called me. Who, what, when, and where. John Chancellor talking about his favorite topic. Hello, I'm Tom Brokaw. Journalism was always more than just a job to John. It was a craft, a calling, a civic duty. John loved being a reporter, and he devoted himself to it all his professional life. He cared about the fundamentals, and his work was distinguished by uncommon clarity and restraint. All that made him a shining example to so many of us who followed. And John's values are embodied to this day in the award that bears his name. He didn't start as an anchor. John's first love was print, Chicago newspapers, and it changed his world. The first event he says, you can get a dress, you can get some ink, you can get some type of paint, you can say anything you want. This is John Cantor on the 25th floor of Chicago. He got into television when it was new. Broadway, he learned about journalism, was and then never forgot. The number of fires in the Miami Negro Group is considerably diminished. John Civil Rights reporting from the Civil War, not only set a standard for television news, it won the respect of his print competitors as well. I mean, that's it. And remember his famous line as he was escorted off the floor of the 1964 Republican Convention? This is John Jennifer somewhere in Texas. Well, here's my set on the air. Just before that. I formally say that this is a disgrace. The press should be allowed, and the radio and television should be allowed to do their work in the convention on television. It was no joke to John. There was a journalistic principle involved. John understood the power of television news, but he wasn't seduced by it. Television coverage was important only when what he is covering was important. Then, television coverage could make history move much faster. He 
witnessed and reported on lots of history during his years on the air. What we saw was possible to forget, necessary to forget. President Carter today condemned the Soviet sponsored coup d'etat in Afghanistan to a Watergate bugging case, Cops and News Tonight, and we're liberal. And he came face to face with many of the people who made that mistake. Jasper, the kind of poem you can stop you. John Shenswell was among the best known journalists in the world, but by choice and by temperament, he always took a back seat to the story itself. There are many perplexities about this monster. He was determined to know and understand and explain the events of the day. John, that was a public trust, and it was his passion. There's a little secret about journalism. We would do it for free if that were possible, but they actually pay us to do it. Since 1995, the John Shaftesbury Award for Excellence in Journalism has helped keep those values alive by recognizing them and others. Some of the most talented, but not always the best known journalists of all our time. I know that John would be in touch with all of them and proud that they have been honored in his name. So, as we begin this special 20th anniversary evening of finally one of the advice to us all from Don Kirk. Get it right. Do the job the way it's supposed to be done. There's an old saying in Chicago journalism that applies here. You say your mother loves you, check it out. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Bill. Uh, Bill Wheatley, a member of our uh, broadcast faculty for so many years and such a great partner of the school, and Andy Franklin and Rob Kaplan from NBC News for producing, for producing that for us for the 20th anniversary. Thank you, guys. So it's in that spirit that we honor Alyssa Rubin's uh, reporting and her body of work, and we've assembled a group of uh, friends and colleagues to, to talk about her uh, tonight. And um, I'd like to ask those of you who will, who will be speaking to come, come to the stage and uh, take, take a seat while we get started. This is, uh, um, this is not a roast. This is a tribute. And I know that Alyssa was a little nervous about uh, the marching orders that the speakers have been given. Um, Nick mentioned the old show, This Is Your Life. Uh, so we have no long lost relatives either, just to deflate any suspense about that. But I'd like to ask our first speaker, uh, who met uh, Lissa in uh, Wichita, Kansas in the 80s, when they were both staff reporters for the Wichita Eagle Beacon. And uh, she went on to become one of the paper's lead project reporters today. She lives in San Francisco, where she's a quite an accomplished science writer and the author most recently of Plastic, a Toxic Love Story. She's also a graduate of the Columbia Journalism School. So please uh, join me in welcoming back Susan Frankel. Well, I uh, thank you so much for letting me be here and be part of this evening, because I'm so proud of Alyssa. Um, I met Alyssa, uh, as Steve said, during her first exotic posting in Wichita, Kansas. We both worked then at what was then called the Wichita Eagle Beacon. Wichita at that time was a weirdly isolated place. It was three hours from any major city and so removed from outside influence that it was actually used as a test market for new products. You could only get the New York Times one day a week for 20 minutes at one store and uh, then the window was closed. Um, bagels, forget it. For a native New Yorker, it was probably as strange and foreign a place as she'd ever been until that point. Alyssa wasn't the only East Coast expat working at the paper, but while many of the other ones there were kind of snobby and treated Kansas like a hardship posting, Alyssa arrived with a curious and open mind, and she maintained that outlook for the four years that she was there. She was eager to understand what life in Kansas was like and to try it on for size, which was kind of a learning curve for a girl raised on the Upper West Side. It meant buying a car and learning to drive. Not very well, I should say. Nobody really wanted to ride shotgun with her. It meant growing an amazing garden. And the secret ingredient was 100 cubic feet of virgin soil that she had a colleague bring her from Western Kansas. 
It meant decorating her house with local touches like the most beautiful bundles of cut wheat you have ever seen. Alyssa started out on the neighborhood news beat, but quickly moved up to covering the county commission and then the state legislature. She quickly figured out how to cultivate sources. She used to bring fresh baked cookies to the secretaries and office workers in the county commission office. It was a smart way to establish a beat, but I also always think about it because it reflected one of the things about Alyssa that I've always admired in her reporting, which is her respect for the intelligence and perspective of ordinary people. You all probably know that Alyssa can be sort of soft-spoken and unassuming, and I think a lot of people took that manner to mean that she probably would get eaten by the politicians she was covering. But she was never afraid or unwilling to stand up to people in power. She heard that one of the county commissioners was hiring unqualified friends or relatives and started looking, out and t looking into what turned out to be a real problem with nepotism. One day, she went out to her car, parked in the official county parking lot, and found that all the windows in the car had been broken. Uh, she tried talking about it with the police officer who was stationed there to watch the parking lot, and he just shrugged his so shoulders and said, no, I didn't see anything. Alyssa continued covering the story undeterred. You could see then that she would be an indefatigable reporter. When the state was revamping its system of property tax reappraisals, Alyssa threw herself into mastering every detail, every mind-numbing detail of the law. She became such an expert that she wrote a guide for homeowners who wanted to appeal their house's reappraisal. The paper decided to offer the booklet for sale and sold so many copies that she had, they actually made more money than her entire annual salary. I asked some friends from the paper when I was preparing for this what they remembered from that time, and one reminded me how once while she was out on a story, Alyssa got a speeding ticket for doing 95 miles per hour on a rural Kansas highway. You know, you would never have even thought that this beat-up old Ford Escort could go that fast. But we both thought it was kind of the perfect metaphor for her, because as he pointed out, as um, unaggressive and humble as she may seem, she's always been ferocious about getting her story. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Next, we'll hear from a journalist who joined the Los Angeles Times in 1978, covering Central America, the Middle East. He was in New York before uh, moving to the Washington Bureau in 1983, and he was a really influential and uh, remarkable bureau chief there for 13 years before he became Washington columnist for the LA Times, where he's still very active and very well read. Uh, some of you may remember his moderation of a presidential primary debate between Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton in January 2008, which he pulled off with characteristic uh, professionalism and toughness. And he's also a great friend. Please welcome Doyle McManus. I'm here, I guess, to talk about the Washington Alyssa, the pre-war Alyssa, the Alyssa who covered mundane beats like Congress, legal affairs, social issues, tobacco, health care, although she was very creative. If you look in her clips from those years, you will even find stories about poetry and nuns. But for her sins, she also had a hand in covering Bill Clinton's Monica Lewinsky scandal. One of my proudest achievements, actually, uh, in my brief career as a manager was the fact that I got to be the guy who hired Alyssa Rubin at the LA Times. It was 1997, and we were looking for someone to cover Congress, but specifically the culture wars, the terrible social issues that were dividing America at the time, especially the bitter battle over uh, restrictions, federal restrictions, on abortion. And so we looked around for reporters who had covered this most difficult of all issues, sensitively, deeply, and well. We found these wonderful clips from this woman we didn't know named Alyssa Rubin, but we asked a reporter who had worked with her, David Willman, one of our investigative reporters, so who is this Alyssa Rubin person? And David said, she is the hardest working reporter I know. And since David was the hardest working reporter I knew, 
That was a pretty good recommendation. But there was one more hurdle. There was a senior editor at the LA Times who was, as it happened, a devout Roman Catholic. And he was keenly sensitive to all of the unconscious biases that can creep into stories about abortion or other social issues. And so we sent him all of Alyssa's clips and we waited and held our breath. And here's what he said. He said, this woman's work is beautiful. I've read every story she's written and I still don't know what her personal views are on the subject. Which takes me to a story of Alyssa's that I want to quote. An extraordinary 2,000 word story in uh, 1999, she went out to Nebraska to do a piece on the real life dilemmas of women who find themselves seeking late term abortions. It was a big issue at the time, it's still a big issue today. And she wrote about three women, real women, women named Wendy and Crystal and Elena. And here's a little of what she wrote. For the Wendy's, the Crystals and Elena's, all the choices are bleak. They come to one of the few physicians in a four state area who is willing to perform abortions up to the 24th week of pregnancy. Crystal came four hours from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. The clinic is bright and the surgical rooms are clean. In the waiting room, a television set blares. Most of the women wear jeans and sweatshirts that hide their bellies. There are a few boyfriends or husbands, but most have come alone. The waiting room faces a nurse's station where a price list is taped to the plexiglass window. An abortion at 12 weeks or less costs $320, 15 weeks, $500, 19 weeks, $900, 22 weeks, $1,850. For many women, collecting that money delays the procedure. And by the time they finally get enough money together to pay for an abortion at the local clinic, it's too late. That story, that price list on the plexiglass window has stayed in my memory for 15 years. It's one of those stories that stays with you. But the most important thing in that story, and I think the most important thing, the most important element in Alyssa's work, isn't just that keen reporter's eye that saw that list and the story it would tell, although that helps. The most important element, I think, is empathy. What we try to do as reporters when we do our jobs as John Chancellor wanted us to do them is we try to illuminate the world's dark places. And to illuminate them, first we have to understand them. And one way to understanding, and maybe even the best way to understanding, is through empathy. And I believe that is what has distinguished Alyssa's work most for 40 years from Wichita to Washington to Baghdad and Kabul. I visited Alyssa in Kabul a few years ago and after a long dinner I told her, you know you've been covering wars for 10 years now. You don't have to keep coming back. And she looked at me with that painfully direct gaze and said, I know that, but I feel I have an obligation to these people. It is an honor and a privilege to have such a person as a colleague and a friend. Thank you, Doyle. Um, our next speaker is uh, the deputy executive editor at the New York Times. She's been at the paper for over three decades and held a wide array of positions, including assistant managing editor, foreign editor, and editor of the Week in Review. She was also a foreign correspondent, reporting from Tokyo, running that bureau, and an author as well. 
and uh, she is the better half of one of my colleagues as, uh, as a bonus. So please welcome Susan Chira. I'm going to echo Susan and Doyle to say how delighted and proud I am that Alyssa is getting the recognition that her work and her character has earned. I first met Alyssa when I was in the process of seduction, um, trying to lure her from the LA Times to the New York Times. And the reason that I worked so hard at that is that when I was casting about for reinforcements in Baghdad, I was then foreign editor, uh, every single one of the people who were foreign correspondents in Baghdad talked about Alyssa. She was sort of the candidate by acclamation. When I asked everyone, who should I turn to, there was not a pause. And one of the things that is quite remarkable is that, as many people have already mentioned, that Alyssa has, since 9-11, been laboring uh, in the wars of our time. And if Paris has told us anything this past week, it's that it's very difficult to escape these wars. And Alyssa's extraordinary experience, her perspective, her compassion, the empathy that Doyle mentioned, the historical sweep and knowledge, and the clear-eyed way that Alyssa has always looked at these wars and at the uh, ways in which the foreign powers who have tried to wage them have misunderstood uh, the countries that they've tried to fight for and in, has really given us such a valuable way to try to wrestle with these questions that will not leave us in this time. So I had a series of lunches with Alyssa when she would come in and we fell for each other pretty fast, I'd say. And finally, we were able to work it out. And Alyssa went to Baghdad, where she encountered uh, a number of things, including the rather formidable personalities in the Times Baghdad Bureau, which Alyssa, of course, won over instantly and uh, defanged in the way that only she could with that kind of gentle but very uh, steely underneath um, as all of us who know her. And in, in uh, first Baghdad and then Kabul, Alyssa wrote a remarkable series of articles about everything, the Iraq Civil War, the tragic shooting in Nisar Square where Alyssa and her colleague relentlessly pursued the unraveling of the Blackwater story that, uh, you know, when they gunned down civilians in Iraq, um, the hubris of Prime Minister Maliki, uh, the graft that sullied the entire Afghan government, the increasing embattlement of Karzai, and typical of Alyssa when America was demonizing him, she would always argue for trying to understand what his perspective was. One of the most memorable stories that uh, Alyssa wrote from her time in Iraq, which has stayed with me for a long time and for which she won an award, was a magazine piece about a suicide bomber, which was published in August 2009, and the headline was, How Beda Wanted to Die. Uh, Alyssa went to the jail where this woman was being held, and they talked, and they talked again. And Alyssa recounts in this very unassuming but very detailed way how she gradually came to realize that this woman may well have been setting Alyssa up to be killed. It's quite a remarkable work of reporting and, and storytelling. And it was also a part of Alyssa's, you know, she covered many, many things, but one of her continuing preoccupations has been how women in these, in these war zones, uh, what has happened to their lives, what has their perspective, what radicalized them, what victimized them, how they survived, how they did not, and uh, I've had the privilege of working with Alyssa on an, an incredible line of reporting about the legacy of the American enterprise in Afghanistan in which she's done very penetrating work about how women are faring as the foreign involvement ebbs. And uh, more of that is coming. It'll be very exciting to read. But I think 
the work on this really sums up a lot of Alyssa's strains and why she's so deserving of this award, because it really is a tragic tale of sort of goodwill and good intentions run aground on a culture that we didn't really understand and whose history we didn't pay sufficient respect to. And this is, to me, one of Alyssa's gifts is that she's, you know, she is a great foreign correspondent. She's fearless in war. She's incredibly careful. You know, the fact is that she's not a reckless person. She's courageous, but she's very thoughtful about weighing the risks and the security about where she goes. But she couples that kind of field determination and knowledge and reporter's eye with an extraordinary grasp of history. Many of you who know Alyssa may know that she's very interested in antique maps. And I, and I think of that as a kind of metaphor for how she also understands the kind of morphing of the modern Middle East and how the constant sort of changing from you know, Ottoman times to now is, is still intertwined with the dilemmas we continue to face in the 21st century. So she has a, an extraordinary span, the perspective, the knowledge, the history, and, but also another remarkable part of Alyssa is that she's a deeply literary person. And it's very typical of Alyssa. I, I wrote her because I knew she had come right from Kabul to Paris, and I wrote saying I was thinking of her. And she wrote me back a beautiful email, as Alyssa's want to do, in which she quoted Yeats. And uh, I would say that that sums up a lot about Alyssa. We're so proud of you. Thank you, Susan. Now I'd like to uh, introduce the editor, executive editor of the New York Times, and he's been running the paper since 2014. And it's a pretty good uh, signal of how beloved Alyssa is that he's made time uh, to share the podium tonight with us. Uh, before becoming executive editor, he was managing editor, assistant managing editor, Washington bureau chief at the New York Times, and then he uh, was also the editor of the Los Angeles Times. Uh, he started out at the Times-Picayune in New Orleans, and, uh, woo, and uh, was uh, a reporter at the Chicago Tribune, where he won a Pulitzer Prize for investigative reporting. But his origins are here at Columbia University, where he majored in English. So please welcome Dean Bacay. <laughs> Thank you. I got to work with Alyssa twice, so I have the honor of, um, of, and I'm grateful to speak on Alyssa's behalf from two newsrooms, um, a series of editors from the late John Carroll to Jill Abramson and Bill Keller. Some 15 years ago, I had the good fortune of being the editor who got to send Alyssa Rubin off to her first foreign assignment. In fact, I remember her and James coming into the Los Angeles Times newsroom for the first time to talk about the job. She was perfect for the job of peacetime chronicler, a time when news organizations, in place of covering wars, were thinking that the story was of a world grappling with social issues like healthcare and education. Besides covering healthcare, she was highly literate, a lover of poetry, as I said, a perfect peacetime correspondent. Who knew that we were sending off one of the great chroniclers of war, someone who would display honor, grace, and humanity under fire, literally, someone who forced us to see Afghan women, but who also understood the blunders of wartime politicians, someone who would break our hearts when she was injured in a helicopter crash, covering a story she felt was necessary. Someone who inspired us, went on her hospital bed. She insisted on asking one question, when can I go back? Thank you, Alyssa, from two staffs and a lot of readers who love you. Congratulations. And uh, finally, before we get to the presentation of the award, it's been one of the traditions of this evening to hear from someone outside of journalism who has had 
some professional engagement with the honoree. And we're really fortunate tonight to have Ambassador Robert Ford with us. Many of you will know about his career, particularly his uh, intellectually independent and uh, important service as U.S. Ambassador to Syria from 2011 to 2014. Uh, but before that, he was also Deputy U.S. Ambassador to Iraq from 2008 to 2010. And he served uh, also as U.S. Ambassador to Algeria between 2006 and 2008. And he's currently a senior fellow at the Middle East Institute in Washington. So please welcome Ambassador Ford. I'm so delighted to be here tonight and to be with Alyssa and James. Alyssa, congratulations on a richly deserved award. I first met Alyssa Labor Day weekend 2003 in Najaf in southern Iraq, in a sense, the center of Iraqi Shia politics and Iraqi Shia uh, religious teaching. And it was clear to me then, and I was fairly new, but Alyssa was asking very penetrating questions, which frankly, I couldn't answer. And that sort of continued for the next five years that I knew her. And she would come to the embassy for briefings, um, or we would have um, private interviews. Two things really came across to me working with Alyssa. Number one, as Susan mentioned, the empathy. It was very clear to me that Alyssa didn't look at Iraqis just as foreigners in a war, but as real people. Second, Alyssa's incredibly smart and insightful. Um, for example, in her writing about the people of Baghdad, and in particular in the majority Shia neighborhoods, she knew people from shopkeepers and students to pilgrims marching in religious processions to clerics, to ministers, and prime ministers. The array, the breadth of contacts was simply stunning. And frankly, no diplomat that I ever met from any country's embassy could match that. I really enjoyed the time where Alyssa and I could compare notes and try to figure out what was happening in the Iraq war. And Alyssa, I always wanted you to write a book about the Iraqi Shia because no one knows them better than you do. And I haven't nagged you about it for the last four years because I haven't seen you for the last four years. But Lissa, you still have to write the book. My wife, Allison, who's also spent 25 years in the Middle East, saw Alyssa getting ready to go out once, putting on an abaya. And Allison, who's tried to put on an abaya a few times herself, said Alyssa was the only Western woman she ever saw who could put on an abaya and actually look like a local. Of course, the blue eyes are a giveaway. But even that is important. Alyssa, I hope you won't mind if I will just relate the brief story that in 2005, in the midst of the worst part of the fighting in Iraq, in Western Iraq, I'm sure many of you remember names cities like Ramadi and Fallujah. Alyssa was not embedded with the United States military, which would have been a far safer thing to do, but used to go out to these towns with an Iraqi driver and would put on her abaya and be in the back seat. And on one occasion, she told me she was actually stopped at an Al-Qaeda checkpoint. Thank heavens she had her abaya on and she was in the back seat while her Iraqi driver told the Al-Qaeda gunman, that's my wife, she's pregnant, she's sick, I'm taking her back to Baghdad. And the Al-Qaeda gunman waved her through. When Alyssa told me that story, I said, perhaps it's time to sort of change the focus a little bit. She insisted on continuing to report the war in the way that she did better than anybody else, up close, talking to people, not just generals, not just soldiers, but the Iraqis. I never saw anyone who could do it better than her. Alyssa, congratulations.
Thank you very much, Ambassador. And uh, now, um, Ira, please join us at the podium. And as you come up, let's congratulate you again on the 20th anniversary of this great institution that you've created here. In 1957, the Arkansas National Guard was called out to prevent African-American children from entering Central High in Little Rock. To cover the event, NBC sent a young journalist named John Chancellor. I became a source for John Chancellor on what was happening at Central High. John Chancellor was my insurance policy, my protection against the world's injustices. Through his reporting, John Chancellor dispelled lies and ignorance. For the first time, the new age of television journalism enabled the world to see the ugliness of racial hatred. And the result was a great advance for the cause of civil rights. That's why journalism is so important today and will be in the future. It is our first line of defense against those who would subject the world to lies and ignorance. By spreading light and truth, journalists have the power and influence to make the world a better place to live in, not just for a few, but for millions or even billions. But it takes courage, character, and integrity. John Chancellor had that courage. Elisa Rubin does too. John Chancellor is my hero. He was my hero at age 16 in Little Rock. And he's still my hero because he represented the truth. When he agreed to permit us to establish the John Chancellor Award, for excellence in journalism. He envisioned rewarding the kind of journalism that would say to successive generations, this is the sort of work to which we should dedicate our lives. Elisa Rubin's work meets that test. She has championed the principles that make society more hospitable to both tolerance and truth. Elisa, we honor the memory of John Chancellor by honoring your work. You have our admiration and gratitude for your contributions to journalism and to society. Elisa? In tribute to the life work of John Chancellor, I am pleased to present Elisa Rubin with the John Chancellor Medal for Excellence in Journalism and a check for $25,000.
Thank you all so much. I am truly overwhelmed, and, and really, so many of the things said tonight were so kind, and I, I, don't, I don't feel I deserve them. But I deeply appreciate that everyone came and, and spoke as they did. I could say much the same about every single person on this stage. I'm truly overwhelmed by this honor and not sure how, how to proceed, but I want to first thank the Chancellor family and say that I hope I have enough time left in my working life to do justice to this award and the memory of John Chancellor, who stood for what we all believe in, which is bearing witness and writing or broadcasting what you see, no matter how hard it is for people to hear it. I also want to thank Ira Lipman for his extraordinary generosity and openness to journalists, not least of all because we live in times when the press so often is seen as something either to be scorned or manipulated. And I would like to thank Columbia University for hosting this award and give a special thanks to Steve Call um, whom I knew first many, many years ago, I'm not even sure if he remembers it, in Washington, D.C., when in one of his many incarnations, he was the editor of the Washington Post magazine and brilliantly edited a piece of mine that I believe was on um, doctors who also did religious healing um, that was desperately in need of his elegant and orderly thought. And I would like to thank Carolyn and Abby and Lisa who have organized tonight and put together the guest list and managed to be sure that everybody got here and brought us all together. It's not an easy job either. And I very much want to thank the judges for reading my work and deciding to give me this award. Often lifetime awards are given posthumously. So I'm very, very glad, given the events in a helicopter on Mount Sinjar, that I could be here tonight and be able to receive it. There are many other journal deserving journalists who could stand here in my place, and many of them are in this room tonight. And so I consider myself extraordinarily lucky. And I should say there are many also who, who can't be with us, who, who've died, um, doing their work, um, and one came to mind particularly as, as people spoke about Iraq, and that is Anthony Shadid, who told the Iraq story like nobody else. Not least of all, I would like to thank my editors at the New York Times, who are led by Dean Bacay, who I've known for most of the last 15 years, and who has had the courage and curiosity to figure out how journalism can use new mediums without being compromised by them and who also is a voracious reader who always has a book to recommend and always wants to know what you're reading. <laughs> when I first heard I'd gotten this award, I had three thoughts. The first was, I hope they didn't give this to me because I was in a helicopter crash. And then, since recovering, I feel that I'm working with more focus and more energy and more excitement um, I thought, well, it's way too early for a lifetime award. I still have so much work to do. You should wait until I'm much, much older. And then my third thought was, who had brought me to this point and who should I thank for that? And as I began to make a list, I was really overwhelmed by how many extraordinary journalists I had had the enormous luck and chance to learn from how many of my colleagues at my early jobs in Kansas and at the Congressional Quarterly and later at the Los Angeles Times and New York Times, and how many editors and photographers who have given me so much as we've journeyed to different places. But I want to say most important and too easily forgotten are the fixers and translators in foreign countries who taught me what mattered in their worlds 
who protected me. and generously offered me many of the ideas that became my stories. They were Serbians and Iraqi, Shia, Sunnis, and Kurds. They are Afghans and Jordanians. They take the most risks, make many of the hardest decisions, and have the most commitment to journalism of any of us, because for them it is far more often a matter of life and death, and we owe them everything. I would like to dedicate this award to my father and mother. I am so sorry that my father cannot be here with us because more than anyone else, he taught me both the love of words, of the poetry and ordinary language, as well as in the works of the great writers. And he taught me to listen to people's stories, their dreams, regrets, their passions, and their rage. My father had a way of not judging people. Perhaps it was his profession. He was a psychiatrist. But I think more than that, he was deeply interested in what drove people to commit acts of beauty and art, but also about what led them to do terrible things. And I've tried to live with his openness to the world and not judge people first, but ask where their actions come from. When I was about 12, maybe 13, but I think 12, our, our family went to see a play at the Brooklyn Academy of Music. And we were coming back late on the F train, and a man boarded our subway car, waving a large knife. My mother and sister and I were frightened and slid down the seat away from the man, which was probably sensible. But my father just sat there as if, as if he was the mailman. And the guy sat down, ranting and waving the knife in front of my father. And my father nodded sympathetically as the man raved. And finally, my father said very gently, you know, you should be careful with that. You could hurt yourself. The man was to him human and vulnerable, not some dangerous other to be avoided. I've carried that thought with me as I've talked to former henchmen for Uday Hussein, Taliban and Al-Qaeda operatives, as well as warlords, who are perhaps more deadly than any of those. And it's always what makes people do what they do. That is the question for me, be it good or ill. Can we see the world enough through their eyes to make the incomprehensibly violent begin to be understood? And can we think about it analytically enough to see where governments or corporations have made mistakes. It was my father who introduced me first to the work of both Martha Gell Gellhorn and Francis Fitzgerald, as well as getting me to read the Iliad. And all three have had a great influence on my thinking. This award is also for my mother, who is just a few days short of 90 and is here tonight. She is still curious about the world. about people, about the why of things, and fostered that in me. After crisscrossing Europe many times, she and my father began traveling to the Muslim world in, when they were in their 70s, visiting Tunisia, Syria, and Turkey. She embraced learning about Islam, the religion, as well as its art and literature, and her combination of intellect and heart is with me every day, along with her voracious interest in other people's lives. Two other family members that I must thank are my husband, James Costello, and my sister, Hannah Rubin. Both would rather that I not go to the places I go, but they have both supported me. And although they could have easily said, I told you so last year when the helicopter crashed, they did not. Thank you, James, for being there, for reading my stories, for being my toughest critic. And thank you, Hannah, for your support and love and for your 101 story ideas. I also want to thank specifically a few people who shaped my career. The first and took a chance on me when I had absolutely no background, had never gone to journalism school and hadn't worked at any, you know, college newspaper or anything of that sort. The first is Steve, Steve Brill, who was my first boss and where I met one of my later bosses, Jill Abramson, who is a similarly incisive mind. Um, 
Steve is a unique character, and I still remember fact-checking his investigative piece on the US government's antitrust case against IBM. There must have been hundreds of facts in the piece, names, dates, times. And at the end, I had missed one thing, the hour at which the judge handed down the decision. And I can still remember Steve yelling at me in exasperation that when it came to facts, 99% was not enough. <laughs> and it's something <laughs> that I think about every working day of my life. He is also the person who said, you can judge a publication by its corrections policy. And if it doesn't admit mistakes, you can't trust it. It was good advice. I want to thank, too, someone else who's not here, but who was very important, and that's Simon Lee, who was then the editor of the, who was the editor of the, foreign editor of the Los Angeles Times, and took a chance on sending me overseas. And Susan Shura, at the time the foreign editor at the New York Times, who hired me and encouraged me to think analytically as well as empathetically. And thank you, too, to Joe Kahn and Michael Slackman, who have allowed me to continue my foreign reporting, both at the New York Times. There is one more person that I wish were here tonight, and that's John Carroll, the New Los Angeles Times former executive editor, a man who was fearless about criticizing the government and knew from his personal experience of covering Vietnam about the government's capacity for lying but managed to be at once a skeptic and a humanist. He died earlier this year at barely 74, which was much too soon. I want to pause here also to thank a couple of colleagues without whom I might not be here today and be working again. Rod Nordland, who writes a lead better than anyone else I know and is an amazing colleague. And Adam Ferguson, an Australian photographer, um, both of them were there for me when the helicopter crashed on Mount Sinjar. And it was Adam, who was then on assignment for the New York Times, who, along with a Kurdish Peshmerga, pulled me from the rebel, rubble and kept me from losing consciousness by talking to me. It was Rod who not only ensured that I was evacuated from Mount Sinjar, he was meeting with a top Kurdish official at the time he got the news and pleaded for him to make sure I got on one of the first helicopters to bring people down. But he then drove through the night um, in Kurdistan, which was under siege by ISIS, if you recall, which was hardly a safe journey, to reach me at a military hospital in northern Iraq. And Rod and Joe Khan on the phone then dealt with a truly jaw-droppingly ill-informed insurance company, which actually proposed initially, as I understand it, evacuating me through a well-known international airport in Mosul, utterly unaware <laughs> that the place had been under ISIS control for <laughs> more than two months, which was a sobering reminder that people don't read that much of what we write. <laughs> um, when I came to consciousness, Joe Khan, who had many more important things to do, was in my hospital room in Istanbul. He's the foreign editor of the New York Times. He had lots of other places in the world to worry about. But what he had done was to bring with him the most important thing in the world to me, a new iPhone and an iPad, a, an enormous vote of confidence and a signal that as far as the paper was concerned, I was still a reporter. It's something I'll never forget. I'm going to finish soon and not, not delay the rest of people's evening, but I want to say a little bit about covering war and express my enormous gratefulness to my editors at the New York Times for their commitment to the coverage and make a plea to other editors, anyone who is here, to keep investing in both foreign reporting and especially conflict coverage. The two questions I get asked most often are, don't you get scared, and don't you get tired of writing about war? And the answer is, of course I get scared, and I never get tired of it. Why? Covering war is like covering life. It's a vast canvas, 
just one that includes guns and explosives. War is sadly part of the human condition. It will not be over during our lifetime, but it is much more than a story of battles and bombs. It is a story of what happens to a country or a people when they are caught in an armed conflict. It is about why they take different sides, and it is a story of civilian lives ruined, of cultural treasures smashed or forgotten, as well as a story of geopolitics that care very little for either the culture or the people. It is a story of refugees, as we've seen this year, and of courageous or impoverished people who cannot or choose not to leave. So it is a rich and compelling drama with something for every reader and certainly for every writer. But more than that, these recent events in Syria and Iraq, in Afghanistan, and most recently in my home city of Paris, have at least some of their roots in US policy decisions. Unless journalists are there to raise questions and to bear witness to what is happening on the ground, we will be relying exclusively on the accounts of the American military and Western diplomats to tell us what is going on. And that will not be the whole story. Often, it will not be tr a true story at all. It is expensive. It is expensive for journalistic organizations to cover wars. It is complicated to staff. It requires constant readjustment and enormous worry for all of the editors involved since staff members are, can be injured, some can even die. But if we do not try to tell the story in all the voices of those living in it and from as close to the ground as we possibly can, we have really failed in our duty in the public trust. Nothing means more to me than when someone says, I learned a lot reading your article, or you made me want to understand more about that. This is the heart of our work. Thank you so very much. <laughs>